welcome to Deer Park's First Baptist Church Adult Bible Study Session. We're looking at Kaleo number 24 this morning, Matthew 5, 43 through 48. In order to help you understand this lesson a little bit, I want to, to tell you a little story about a little girl stayed at home uh, of a friend of hers and, and, and the vegetable that night for dinner was buttered broccoli. And the mother asked, do you like buttered broccoli? And, and the little child replied, oh yes, I love it. But when the bowl of broccoli was passed to her, she didn't take any of it. Well, the mom was worried about that, so she said, I thought you said you love broccoli. And the little girl replied sweetly, oh yes ma'am, I do, but not enough to eat it. You see, this, just keep that little thought in mind as we go through this material this morning for a few minutes and you'll see what, uh, see what the little girl was talking about. Jesus was sitting on the side of a hill with the Beatitudes and, and teaching his disciples what the consecrated life is all about. Now, Jesus' words that he was telling them, it challenged the very core of their being by what he was saying. You can almost hear the disciples now uh, mumbling among themselves that they, you mean we're blessed when we're poor in spirit, really? Uh, we're blessed when we mourn? That doesn't sound like blessing. And we're to rejoice when we're persecuted? Wow, I don't like the sound of that one either. Turn the other cheek? Go the extra mile? Give without hesitation? You know, as the disciples was processing all this information, Jesus added another. Look at Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48. You have heard it said that it was, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, let me just say something about that right now. Uh, it, most of you in your Bible, if you look, you, you'll have a reference, uh, a scripture reference to the Old Testament there of Leviticus 19.18. Well, somewhere along the line, these scribes had, had added uh, something to, about hating your enemy because Leviticus 19.18 doesn't say hate your enemy. It says love your neighbor. But anyway, that, that's just a side point, but go on. It said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collector do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collector do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Love your enemies. I'm telling you guys, not only refrain from retaliating against your enemies, but actively demonstrate love for that neighbor. Now, this, this is a love that's not driven by, by circumstances or, or emotion or whatever it is. It's driven by love, period. And Now, you know, translate that to today about loving your neighbor. Now, uh, let me just think with you here for a minute uh, about, about a neighbor named Jim. But, but Lord, uh, I, don't, I don't think you know Jim. I mean, this guy lives next door. And he's got a dog that barks half the night, keeps me awake. I mean, how, how am I supposed to love him? But then I've got another, another neighbor named Bob. But Lord, Bob has five cars over there at his house. None of them in the garage. Two of them parked in front of my house. What am I supposed to do about that? How about another neighbor? But Lord, you just don't understand this neighbor. He's got a pool in the backyard. He has wild parties. They're loud. And actually, sometimes they throw beer cans over my fence into my yard. What am I supposed to do about that? Now, we could go, we could carry that on to whatever your neighbor does that, 
Uh, I don't have neighbors like that either, but uh, but I know one thing. I didn't hear Jesus say one time in there, love your neighbor unless one of those things happens to you. Jesus said, love your neighbor. See, he didn't, but he didn't ask his followers to love the way our enemies live. He asked us to love them for who they were, not how they live, not the habits they have. I want to bring up uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. again because when you weigh what uh, Martin Luther King did then with what's going on today, you, you see quite a contrast here. See, he believed that the love of enemies was the only permanent solution to the African-American segregation and discrimination in the United States. He began the last paragraph of his sermon of loving your enemies with the following. He said this, To our most bitter opponents, we say, Do to us what you will, and we shall continue to love you. For Dr. King, do to us what you will, included unjustly sending African Americans to jail, bombing their homes, threatening their children, and committing violence in their communities. One reason Dr. King gave for rejecting hate and loving enemies was that by its very nature, he said, hate destroys and tears down. By its very nature, love creates and builds up. See, love transforms with redemptive power. When you look at what's going on today compared with what he did, we see a, a, a quite a contrast there of maybe something that would work today. You see, when we, we, we studied the life of Jesus, which we've done a, a year ago, uh, we, we studied the life of Jesus for a long time. You see, Jesus loved. He loved when he was tired. You, you take the woman at the well, he was give out. The disciples went on into town to buy food. And, and he sat there and, and uh, talked to this, uh, this woman uh, about the, the life-giving water that he had. See, he loved when he was misunderstood. The Pharisees, the scribes, he hated what they did, but he loved them as individuals, as humanity. He loved people when he was persecuted. We see that throughout the life of Jesus. And he loved those that refused to love him. I guess that's one of the harder ones, isn't it? That we love those that refuse to love us. You see, Jesus' love knew no bounds. Just remember, God shows kindness to all, not just believers. Well, why do you say that? Well, in verse 45, what did we read? that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. You see, he, he does this for all humanity. See, Jesus expected his disciples to learn that kind of love. Now, there's four different types of love that, that we understand in Greek, uh, in, in, in this scripture. Now, I'm not going to go into a long... Uh, Wendy study on, on those four. Now you can look those up yourself, but I'm just going to name the four. Storage is a love for your family. It's a love for your, your parents. It's a love for your child. There's eros, which is a sexual love, passion of human love. Phileo is a warm, tender, compassionate type of love. Between friends, you can have that kind of friendship between good friends. And then there's agape, God's love for humanity, which flows from grace and mercy. Now, you got to remember this when we're talking about love your neighbor. See, God never asked us to love our neighbor like we love our family. He never asked us to love our neighbor like we love our wife. He never asked us to love our neighbor with tender, affectionate love between close friends. But he did ask us to love like he loves, and that's agape love. You see, when we use the term fall in love, that's an emotional term. We fall in love. When we say we love our enemies, it becomes not only the heart, but it becomes something of the will. 
Here we're beginning to understand agape love. It is something we cannot help, guys. It, it is something we will ourselves to do, is to love one another. That's not that lovable to you. I think one of the greatest uh, examples that, that I can think of, it, it, you'll remember this name, I think, uh, a guy named Ernie Zamperini. He's the subject of a book called Unbroken and subsequent movie of Unbroken. He was a World War II prisoner of war. It, it, it's horrendous the things he went through as prisoner of war. He was repeatedly and mercilessly beaten, starved half to death, but he was finally released. And he came home and, and emotionally uh, devastated Ernie. He had a lot of problems when he came home dealing with what was on, but on his mind constantly was, one day I will go back to Japan and I will look these guys up and I will get revenge. Because I, I guess that's human nature, what you want to do. But then something happened to Ernie. He stumbled into a Billy Graham crusade and the Lord miraculously saved him. And at that point, all of that emotional baggage, all of that desire to revenge was gone. He never again did that. And, it's some, and, and as the story goes, you remember this story if you read it in the book or saw the movie. Four years later, Ernie Zamperini, he returned to Japan and shared the gospel with the Japanese people and the guards who had tortured him for those long years in the prison camp. Matter of fact, he did another thing that, that we remember. He tried his best to contact one of the guards named Bird, I think was his name, that dealt him so much misery. He did actually make contact with Bird, the best I remember, but he would not come and meet with Ernie. But Ernie did his best to reach out and touch that and, and, and share with whatever he needed to do there. You see, agape is, is not a feeling, guys. It's not something you feel emotionally. It's a determination of the mind to love those people because Christ loves them. Someone put it this way. He said, it is the power to love those we do not like and who may not like us. The power to love those we do not like and who may not like us. Keep in mind as we do this that this note, this type of love is only possible for a Christian. It's only when Christ lives in our heart and, and that bitterness will die. And this love, type of love, will spring to life. If Christ lives here, it will die. That, that revenge, that bitterness will die. Now, what the scriptures say we're supposed to do for those neighbors, do for those people we don't like, Scripture says clearly, pray for them. Now, it's been said before, I know you've read this before too, that it's almost impossible, I think it is impossible, to pray for someone and hate them at the same time. It just doesn't work that way, guys. If you want to kill bitterness, pray for the one we are tempted to hate. I have to tell you a little personal story here about this because uh, I've I've been there and done that. The first several years, Glendine and I were married. Uh, I, I, I didn't, I didn't hate her, but I wasn't real fond of her mother. Now, now the reason I wasn't fond of her mother was because her mother was mean to Glendine. She treated her like you did not want your wife treated, and for that reason, I didn't spend a lot of time around her house. We did what we could, but then I decided one day, you know what, I, I need to pray for this woman. I, I'm going to start praying for her mother and see, see what happens. Well, the minute I started praying, this is the way I prayed. Lord, I wish you'd take care of that woman. I mean, change her mind. Do, do something with her. Make her not be so bitter and, and, and mean when we're there. Make her see things in a different light. Well, I prayed that a long time, and 
Not a whole lot changed. But in time, as I continued to pray, did it change her mother? <laughs> no. <laughs> it didn't change her mother a whole lot. But it changed me. That bitterness that I felt because of the way she treated Glendine began to subside and began to go away. And then I learned something very important about that. It's hard to hate someone and feel bad for someone when you pray for them because it's a reality, guys. That's just a little personal story that, that uh, you try that sometimes if you've not already done it. And then we come up to the very last part of that verse that says this, Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, by now, uh, these, these guys sitting around there, the disciples had to be, their head had to be spinning. Be perfect. Are you kidding me? God is perfect. We cannot be like God. We cannot, we cannot be that way. How can it be anyway? Then Jesus, he might have said something like this. Well, that's good. You finally understand what love is all about. You Maybe you get it. You need a Savior. So maybe you understand something after all. When we think about that for a minute, guys, remember this little ditty he used to say as, as kids, maybe before us? Little Jack Honor sat in the corner eating a Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, oh, what a good boy am I. <laughs> See, there's a lot of that in religion today. We do that a lot. We do all the churchy things, so we must be all right. Well, man, I even teach a Sunday school class. How about that? Or I, I go to church at least once a week. I, I do this. I do that. I, I tithe. I do all this. And what did Jesus say about all the things we do? He said, our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. It's got to be better than that, guys. It's not something we do. It's what Jesus does. You see, the only way we become perfect is through our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, Scripture says that Christ imputes his righteousness to us. Now, I want you to look that word up. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I had to look it up too. Christ imputes righteousness to you. And then the slow process of sanctification begins where God attempts to conform you to the image of Christ. Sanctification is a process. It doesn't happen all at one time. It, it's a process. It's a journey. He that begin a good work in you will complete that good work. We have to remember scriptures like that, guys. We're not, we're not complete yet. God's going to continue to work on us. God's going to continue to change our mind and to deal with us in, in, in righteous ways. Now, but being perfect is to fulfill the purpose for which we're created. You know, well, what is perfect anyway? You'd ask that question, what is perfect? What do you mean by that, being perfect? Nobody can be perfect. Well, being perfect is simply to fulfill the purpose for which we're created. You know, you think about this for a minute. I, I use a, an example of, of a Phillips screwdriver. You've got a screw here, and, and you want to tighten it. You, you have a Phillips screwdriver that perfectly fits the head of that screwdriver, uh, ahead of that screw. You put it in there, you turn it, you tighten it up, you do it exactly the way it's supposed to be. It fits perfect. See, that's a tool that does what it was created to do. See, God created us in his image. So we're created. Scripture tells us to have the mind of Christ. So what do we do? If we're created in God's image, then we are to have that mind of Christ. We have to become that which we were created to be. Keep that in mind too. Romans 8, 1 says, once all that happens, therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, let me, let me just uh, bring this to a conclusion some way. Jesus left no wiggle room when he commanded his followers to love their enemies. He, he didn't say maybe, if you won't do, if you like them, if they're good people. No, no, no. There was no wiggle room. He flat out said to love your enemies. No exception, no loopholes. Loving your enemies involves attitude and action.
keep in mind again, guys, when we think about loving your neighbor, the loving your neighbor does not require you to have a warm and fuzzy feeling for him. It means seeking his well-being. It means seeking uh, one to, to come to know Christ. We have to see others through God's eyes when we're talking about becoming perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. Now, as we've talked about this before, uh, uh, Pastor Jim said it in a sermon recently. I think we probably said it in here a few times. See, we cannot love our enemies unless God is at work within us. We can't do this by ourselves. You have to have help. If you try it yourself, you'll, you'll fail. But we have to have the help of Jesus. Let God work within you to accomplish what he wants to accomplish through Scripture. And that's transforming our hearts and minds to the mind of Christ. Let me just close with a statement from, from Oswald Chambers says this, the secret of a Christian's life is that the supernatural is made natural by the grace of God. One more time, the secret of a Christian's life is that the supernatural is made natural by the grace of God. I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you for uh, tuning in today. And uh, we'll continue to do this at least for a, a few more weeks until we get back to, to open uh, worship. And uh, we hope that is soon. I'm going to pray for us quickly, and then we'll be dismissed from this session. Our Lord Jesus, we we just grateful, God, that uh, you, you have told us so much in your word, how we are to act, how we are to, to live, uh, the attitudes that we have, the, the way we should approach people, the way we should love people. Lord, you've told us a whole lot more than we do. We understand what we're to do a whole lot more than we do. But Lord, I just pray right now, God, that if we've got a neighbor out there, we're going to love that neighbor the way you love them. We're going to try to get along. We're going to we're going to be nice. We're going to be uh, uh, we're going to be whoever we need to be to try to win that neighbor to Christ. And Lord, we pray you'll show us how to do that. Lord, we just uh, by doing that, Lord, we know that we have to have you in our heart. We have to have you to guide and direct us. And we pray that uh, you'll continue to do that in our lives. Lord, I continue to lift up our church, lift up our body to you. God, that we may be used in a very special way in this area of your part right now. Lord, I pray you'll go with us from this place, that you'll use us next week to accomplish your purpose, wherever we may be and whatever we may be doing. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this day.